In the last two years, MABE has explored the 50-year history of bilingual education in our region. At MABE's 2022 conference, we explored how pioneers led legislation supporting bilingual education in Massachusetts. In MABE's 2023 conference, we honored the giants that collaborated with the Department of Education to bring about change. This year, at our MABE 2024 conference, we are reminded of the critical role that communities have in advocating for bilingual education. Rhode Island is unique from other states in the region, not just because Rhode Island is small but mighty, but because advocacy found strength through collaboration, not legislation. Rhode Island valiantly took a more grassroots approach to ensuring the best possible education for its multilingual learners. And that all started with communities working together to create visions for change. In Rhode Island, in the beginning, the, the outlook on bilingual education was get them into English as soon as possible. So we had an early exit program. The attitude in Rhode Island has shifted to dual language programs where students who are not fluent in Spanish are learning Spanish and students who are fluent in Spanish are learning English and neither group loses anything but both add on to their knowledge. The research proves that the bilingual brain processes information differently from a monolingual brain and that that ultimately strengthens one's capacity to problem solve and think critically. There are many people who are not involved in dual language who don't know that research, who don't understand how the program functions and who can have the misinformation that students are sort of learning half the time, particularly people who are making decisions about the program who may not have ever taught in the program. When I think back to the early 2000s, I feel as though the Education Alliance at Brown was a really strong driver of external partnerships for schools. We started to develop these organic collaborations, both like within the lab networks and the different regions around the country, which infused the practices and policies that we were trying to develop here in Rhode Island. I was part of a group that was working on something called the Diversity Toolkit. It became a collaboration with other educational labs from around the country who were really doing a lot of important work around funds of knowledge and around um, thinking about the cultural assets and linguistic assets that families bring, there came an opportunity to be a part of driving the mission and vision of what now has become the International Charter School, what is now our longest standing dual language program in the state. There were so many people who had been doing the work and one of them is Julie Nora, who is the director at ICS. The International Charter School is an independent charter school, which allowed us to have a lot of freedoms in terms of, at that time in 2001, the curricula that we developed as well as the pedagogies. And so we were able to implement two dual language programs in our school. And this allowed us to help meet the needs of the immigrant communities, as well as those English-speaking families who were interested in their children becoming bilingual. The dual language model is something that allows for the students who are speakers of Spanish and Portuguese, in the case of our program, to build on what they already have with an asset orientation towards their languages and cultures. So our first fully dual language group started in the fall of 2005. And when it became a 50-50 model in that student cohort from kindergarten through third grade, by the time they reached third grade and took the state test, they were solely responsible for removing the school from corrective action based on their level of success. Central Falls School District was the first implementer in the state of Rhode Island in 2015 of the seal of biliteracy. We mobilized legislatively by going to the state house and proposing bills. We advocated regionally and, and school district work groups. I could not have done this without the support of my paraprofessional colleagues who were in tune with what it meant to be bicultural and biliterate. It helped folks to see that if a student 
was literate in one language, there were some transfers that could be made skills-wise, but also belief-wise, because there is a deficit thinking that if you speak a language other than English, then you can be considered less than, when actually knowing other languages is something additive, something that enhances you. In 2015, we had 50% of the graduating class of seniors become recipients of the seal of biliteracy. By 2017, we increased by 111%, about five years after we piloted, the seal of biliteracy went into effect statewide. Collaboration amongst educators and communities helped form our current bilingual education landscape. It is important to remember that this is in itself a form of advocacy. Advocacy is seen every day by our students and families when they interact with you in your classrooms and schools. Advocacy can be seen when we present at conferences. It is our responsibility to empower educators, students, and communities to find a voice to bravely inspire change. You know, whenever they would buy, for example, a new reading program, they wouldn't consider what was needed for the bilingual classroom. So we wouldn't get the new material because it didn't come in Spanish. When I first started in bilingual education, we had to make our own materials. There was nothing out there. I would go to Puerto Rico on a trip or Dominican Republic and come back with, you know, a suitcase full of books because I didn't have reading material in Spanish. That's the kinds of things that we did to adapt our instruction. It's challenging to be a program within a district that is not entirely dual language. So many of us are constantly advocating for materials, for program considerations, for not over-testing in the dominant language, for not imposing one size fits all instructions and directions on how we function and allowing us to make decisions based on what is best for the program and the students needs. So there's that level of advocacy. Then there is the school level of advocacy where we, our team is advocating for students constantly, what they need, how to get what they need, looking for resources in the community, working with the families. There were other states in the, in the country who had passed the English only laws. And Rhode Island kept trying to, but we just continuously put that pressure on so that it wouldn't pass. So we had this network of people, starting with our professors at Rhode Island College, the administrators in the, the program itself at the district level, and then teachers. And we then would disseminate the information to the parents often you know were called telling us that we needed to run down to the state house because there was going to be a meeting and they wanted a show of support from the teachers we would go and get parents to advocate for maintaining a bilingual program we were just constantly doing whatever we needed to do writing letters to our representatives to make sure that this law didn't pass in this state in that early stage where there was not a state-sponsored seal of biliteracy. Advocacy really looked like building relationships with a bunch of people in the network and even people outside of the networks. We leveraged our organizations such as MABE, Rhode Island Teachers of English Language Learners, RITEL. We often faced lack of understanding among other professionals, counselors, social workers, principals, regarding the bilingual program. We were having to advocate for ourselves, for our kids on numerous fronts. So one of the things that I had said was, listen, we have to be on every committee there is. Like if there's a parent engagement committee, we need to be on it. Because if we're not on it, our kids have no voice. Our bilingual teachers raised their hand and said, well, what about us? And they were like, what do you mean, what about you? Well, where is this in Spanish? We need this in Spanish. And so they fought for that. We extended ourselves into our own communities, wherever our school was. We made sure we had representation on the advisory committee to the governor. That was the only way our kids got any kind of you know, representation, was us forcing ourselves into the committee. Interestingly, there's a lot more policy support now for dual language models, especially with our current commissioner who has really pushed that agenda forward in Rhode Island and kind of officialized 
it as something that she speaks about as being the best model for students who speak a language other than English at home. That has been helpful in terms of developing people's awareness and understanding. Overall, Rhode Island is positioned in a, such a way that we can build high quality dual language programs. Um, but what we really need is a statewide coordination of efforts. Since we started advocating for growing dual language programs, there are a few successes that we've seen. So we now have at the Rhode Island Department of Education a World Languages and Multilingual Learner Specialist in place. We also have the Blueprint for Multilingual Learner Success that came out a couple of years ago. We still have a lot more education to do in terms of educating policymakers and state level leaders about the value of dual language education and what it looks like. We really need to be talking about that in every education decision that's made, and especially as our student population becomes more and more multilingual. It's important that you are always advocating for the programs. It's not always the case that the federal or the state requirements will be taking into account the needs at the ground level. I think what can continue to help more is more systematic support of dual language education where we have advocates who are helping to increase the teacher pipeline, um, making modifications for some of the legislation that might limit the ability to teach in two languages. We must share responsibility for cultivating a linguistically diverse teacher workforce by increasing opportunities for educators of multilingual learners. Looking at the regulations for the certification of bilingual dual language educators and, and making them a little bit more accessible because the testing requirements that are pretty much all in English are a huge barrier for us getting more dual language educators certified, even though they've shown to be highly effective educators, sometimes they're denied certification because they can't pass, for example, a praxis, early childhood exam in English. So we have started in the coalition to do a little more targeted outreach to this population. We need to really start home growing our teachers. We need to encourage young people to go into the profession at all let alone people who are bilingual. We have been forced to try to innovate, and one really bright light for us has been our paraprofessional teachers, teachers who have worked in our school for many, many years and who have decided to pursue a profession of teaching and have been tremendous assets to our teaching team. So we have been very strategically recruiting and hiring from the community. They're committed to the children in a very personal way in terms of helping our students succeed both by becoming bilingual and by honoring their cultures and their backgrounds and their assets that they come with and helping to guide them to a place where they can give back to the community. We now have, besides the Coalition for a Multilingual Rhode Island, as a subset of that, we have a dual language network where all of the schools are connected as well as the higher education partners that are preparing bilingual dual language education teachers. So we're all working collectively to ensure that we have enough teachers and that young people who grew up in the community who are bilingual and interested in becoming educators have a clear path to also becoming bilingual educators. So we are in a good position, I think, to create that cycle that's necessary to sustain the programs. If you create the space where you are honoring bilingualism and biculturalism and not bowing to the pressures that will inevitably be placed upon you and the challenges and saying, no, it's too hard, we're gonna give up. If you continue to fight and little by little, you, how you're succeeding and growing, it eventually will blossom. We have amazing students here who are multilingual humans. Every school here could be a dual language school and we could really just think about the community assets that we have to reshape our educational systems. If we want success in society, not just in MLL education, but in society at large, then we need to help our students recognize that bilingualism, trilingualism is an asset and make them proud of that ability and not take that ability away from them.
I'm very proud of the fact that former students of mine are doing the kind of work that they're doing. They're all successful and my hope beyond that is that they'll give back, that they'll encourage their children to speak Spanish. They'll use their power to vote to protect the programs that got them where they are and get involved in the community so that we don't lose that enrichment that bilingualism brings to society. That's what I mean by the fruits of our labor. We are all educators of multilingual learners. On March 8, 2024, MAVE worked to unite partners in bilingual education in the region to inspire productive solutions to teacher licensure challenges. Collaboration through coordinated efforts is critical to change and sustain growth. Join our effort to invest in our bilingual educators and dual language education. Our multilingual learners and families deserve it.